And we find ourselves back here. Kate D. Camillas. Ah, ah, ah. There it is. Kate D. Camillas, The Tale of Despero. One of my all-time favorites. And without further ado, we're going to jump right in to the fourth book titled Recalled to the Light. Again, this light and dark continues to play out, supporting our theme of light versus dark, good versus evil. Keep your eyes and ears open for both literal and figurative light and darkness. That will help deepen your understanding of theme and help you track this diabolical plan that Roscuro is hatching. Hatching with the help of poor simple-minded Mig, who wants nothing more in life than to be a princess. From a serving girl to a princess. Sounds like a long shot to me. Let's find out. Chapter 34. Kill him, even if they's already dead. Reader, you did not forget about our small mouse, did you? Back to the light, was what Gregory whispered to him when he wrapped Despero in his napkin and placed him on the tray. And then Mig, after her conversation with Roscuro, carried the tray into the kitchen. And when she saw Cook, she shouted, shouted, It's me, Mickery Sow, back from the deep downs. Oh, lovely, said Cook. And ain't we all relieved. Mig put the tray on the counter. Here, here, said Cook. Your duties ain't done. You must clear it. How's that? shouted Mig. <sighs> you must clear the tray, shouted Cook. She reached over and took hold of the napkin and gave it a good shake and Despero tumbled out of the napkin and landed right directly, plop, into a measuring cup full of oil. Ugh, said Cook. Ugh, a mouse in my kitchen, in my cooking oil, in my measuring cup. You, Mig, kill him, dire kill him directly. Mig bent her head and looked at the mouse, slowly sinking to the bottom of the glass cup. Poor little Macy, she said. And she stuck her hand into the oil and pulled him out by his tail. Poor little Macy. Despero, gasping and coughing and blinking at the bright light, could have wept with joy at his rescue, but he was not given time to cry. Kill him! shouted the cook. Go! said Mig. All right! Holding Despero by the tail, she, she went to get the kitchen knife, but the mouse tail covered as it was in oil, was so slick and difficult to hold on to, and Mig, in reaching for the knife, loosened her grip, and Despero fell to the floor. Mig looked down at the little bundle of brown fur. Go, she said. Well, that killed him for sure. Kill him even if he's already dead, shouted the cook. That's my philosophy with mice. If they're alive, kill them, and if they're dead, kill them. That way you can be very certain of having your dead mouse, which is the only kind of mouse to have. Well, that's some good sophosy. I think you probably meant philosophy. That's some good sophosy. That is, kill him if they's already dead. Hurry, you cauliflower-eared fool, shouted Cook. Hurry! Despero lifted his head from the floor. The afternoon sun was shining through the large kitchen window. He had time to think of how miraculous the light was, and then it disappeared, and Mig's face loomed into view. She studied him, breathing through her mouth. <sighs> Little Macy, she said, ain't you gonna skedaddle, you know? Despero looked for a long moment into Mig's small, concerned eyes, and then there came a blinding flash, and the sound of metal, <laughs> moving through the air as Mig brought the n kitchen knife down, down, down. Despero felt a very intense pain in his hindquarters. He leapt up and into action. Reader, he scurried. He scurried like the professional mouse. He zigged to the left. He zagged to the right. Go! shouted Mig. Missed him? Ain't that a surprise, said Cook, just as Despero scurried under a crack in the pantry door. I got the little Macy's tail, though, said Mig. She bent over and picked up Despero's tail and held it up proudly, displaying it, to the, displaying it to the cook. So, shouted the cook, what good will it do us when the rest of him has disappeared into the pantry? I don't know, said Mig. And she braced herself as the cook advanced upon her, intending to give her a good clout to the ear. 
I don't know. Poor girl. Chapter 35, The Knight in Shining Armor. Despero was pondering the reverse of that question. He was wondering not what he could do with his tail, but what he would do without it. He was sitting on a bag of flour high atop his shelf in the pantry, crying for what he had lost. The pain in his hindquarters was intense, and he wept because of it. But he also cried because he was happy. He was out of the dungeon, and he had been recalled to the light. His rescue had happened just in time for him to save the Princess P from the terrible fate that the rat had planned for her. So Despero wept with joy and with pain and with gratitude. He wept with exhaustion and despair and hope. He wept with all of the emotions that a young small mouse who had been sent to his death and then been delivered from it in time to save his beloved. He wept with all of those emotions that he could feel. Reader, the mouse wept. And then he lay down on the sack of flour and slept. Outside the castle, the sun set and the stars came out one by one, and then they disappeared and gave way to the rising sun, and still Despero slept. And while he slept, he dreamt. He dreamt of the stained glass windows and the dark of the dungeon. In Despero's dream, the light came to life, brilliant and glorious, in the shape of a knight swinging a sword. The knight fought the dark. Was the knight fighting literal darkness? Or was he fighting figurative darkness? I want you to think about this. On one hand, the knight was swinging his sword in the dark, and so perhaps he was slicing away at literal darkness. But do you feel like that's what the true meaning of that sentence is? Or was the knight fighting evil? Let's read on and see. And the dark took many shapes. First, the dark was his mother uttering phrases in French. And then the dark became his father beating the drum. The dark was furlough wearing a black hood and shaking his head no. And the dark became a huge rat smiling a rat, I mean smiling a smile that was deep, evil, and sharp. The dark. Despero cried, turning his head to the left. The light, he murmured, turning his head to the right. He called out to the knight. He shouted, Who are you? Will you save me? But the knight did not answer him. Tell me who you are, Despero shouted. The knight stopped swinging his sword. He looked at Despero. You know me, he said. No, no, I don't. You do said the knight. He slowly took the armor off of his head and revealed nothing, no one. The suit of armor was empty. No, 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 said Despero. There is no knight in shining armor. It is all just make-believe, like happily ever after. And in his deep sleep, reader, the small mouse began to cry. Chapter 36 what Mig carried. And this is our final chapter for today. And while the mouse slept, Roscuro put his terrible plan into effect. Would you like to hear, reader, how it all unfolded? The story is not a pretty one. There is violence in it and cruelty. But stories that are not pretty have a certain value too, I suppose. Everything, as you well know, having lived in this world long enough, to have figured out a thing or two for yourself, you know that it cannot always be sweetness and light. Listen, this is how it happened. First, the rat finished once and for all the job that he had started out long ago. He chewed through Gregory's rope, all the way through it, so that the jailer might become lost in the maze of the dungeon. Late at night, when the castle was dark, the serving girl, Miggery Sow, climbed the stairs to the princess's room. In her hand, she carried a candle, and in the pockets of her apron were two very ominous things. In the right pocket, 
hidden in case they should encounter anyone on the stairs, was a rat with a spoon on his head and a cloak of red around his shoulders. In the left pocket was a kitchen knife. The same knife that Miggery Sow had used to cut off the tail of a certain mouse. These were the things, a rat, a knife, and a candle that Mig carried with her as she climbed up, up, up the stairs. Gore, she shouted to the rat. It's dark, ain't it? Yes, yes, whispered Roscuro in her pocket. It is quite dark, my dear. When I am a princess, began Mig. Shh, said Roscuro. May I suggest that you keep your glorious plans for your future to yourself? And may I further suggest that you keep your voice down for a whisp to a whisper? We are, after all, on a covert mission. Covert means secret. Do you know how to whisper, my dear? I do, shouted Mig. Then please, shouted, said Roscuro, please institute this knowledge immediately. Go, whispered Mig. All right. Thank you, said Roscuro. Do I need to review with you again our plan of action? I got it straight right here in my head, whispered Mig, and she tapped the side of her head with one finger. Oh, how comforting, said Roscuro. Perhaps, my dear, we should go over it again. One more time, you know, just to be sure. Well, said Mig, we go into the princess's room, and she will be sleeping and snoozing and snoring. And I will wake her and up and show her the knife, and I will say, If you does not want to get hurt, princess, you must come with me. And you will not hurt her, said Roscuro. No, I won't, because I want her to live so that she can be my lady in waiting when I become the princess. Exactly, said Roscuro. That will be her divine comeuppance. Oh, whispered Mig. Yes, her divine comeuppance. Mig had, of course, no idea what the phrase divine up com uh, comeuppance meant, but she very much liked the sound of it, and she repeated it over and over to herself until Roscuro said, And then? Well, let me stop you there. Divine up a comeuppance means when you, you finally get your own. A comeuppance is when you learn your lesson. So they're trying to teach. They're trying to teach Princess P a big lesson. Yikes. And then, continued Mig, I tells her to get out of her princess bed and come with me on a little journey. Ha, <laughs> said Roscuro, a little journey. Yeah, this is right. Ha, I like the understatement of that phrase. A little journey. Oh, it'll be a little journey. Indeed it will. And then, said Mig, who was now coming to her favorite part of the plan, we will take her to the deep downs. We will take her to the deep downs and we will give her some long lessons on how to be a serving girl. And we gives me some short lessons on how to be a princess. And when we is all done studying up, we switch places. I get to be the princess, and she gets to be the maid. Gore! Reader, this is the very plan that Roscuro presented to Mig when he first met her. It was, of course, a ridiculous plan. No one would ever, not for a blind minute, mistake Mig for a princess or a princess for Mig. But Miggery Sow, as I have pointed out to you before, was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And reader, too. She wanted so desperately to become a princess. She wanted, oh, how she wanted. And it was because of this terrible wanting that she was able to believe in Roscuro's plan with every ounce of her heart. The rat's real plan, in a way, was more simple and more terrible. He intended to take the princess to the deepest, darkest part of the dungeon. He intended to have Mig put chains on the princess's hands and feet and intended to keep the glittering, glowing princess, laughing princess there in the dark forever. And that is where we will stop for today. We have a lot to think about, reader.
I happen to be a nervous wreck. I might have to peek ahead and read a little bit further, but not with you and not until tomorrow. Have a great day, guys.